Good evening and welcome to our ReggieCon panel discussing Under the Cottonwood Tree, written by Paul and Carlos Meyer and illustrated by Margaret Hardy. We are thrilled to have you join us for our second year of ReggieCon at Illinois State University and our first ReggieCon panel of the 2021-22 year. My name is Amelia Noel Elkins and I am the Interim Assistant Vice President for Student Success at Illinois State. And we are thrilled tonight to join in the celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month through this conversation. Before we begin the panel, just a few details to keep everything running smoothly for all of you in the audience. Please know that this session is being recorded and will be archived on the ReggieCon website. Also, if you need confirmation that you attended tonight's ReggieCon event, we will post a link to a form for you to submit a request for confirmation of attendance. While the presenter's video and audio are on, we cannot hear or see any guests. However, we will be monitoring the Q&A function, so we encourage you to ask questions of the presenters and panelists. After some initial discussion, our panelists will be taking questions from the attendees. Please visit the ReggieCon website at illinoisstate.edu backslash ReggieCon to find ReggieCon merchandise. A portion of the proceeds from the ReggieCon merchandise sales will be donated to the Red and White Fund to benefit, benefit Illinois State students in financial need. And for those students who submitted their names at Festival ISU, we will be pulling three names at random to receive a gift bag full of ReggieCon merchandise. Also at the ReggieCon website, you can find recordings of previous panels and information about ReggieCon panels for the remainder of the 2021-22 academic year. Our hope is that in the spring, we will be able to host a live event for ReggieCon. Keep checking the website for updates. At this time, I am pleased to introduce our moderator and panelist for the discussion of Under the Cottonwood Tree, Dr. Scott Jordan, who is the professor and chair of psychology here at Illinois State. As many of you in the audience know, the Illinois State community suffered a loss today. Before Scott introduces the panelists, he will say a few words about graduate student Jelani Day. Scott, I'll hand it over to you. Um, thank you, Dr. Noah Elkins. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Scott Jordan, aka Zombie Scotty, cognitive psychologist, philosopher here at Illinois State University. Before we begin this evening's panel, we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that our community has suffered a tremendous loss with the passing of ISU graduate student Jelani Day. We ask you continue to keep Jelani's family in your thoughts and to come together to support each other in the coming days, weeks, and beyond. I encourage all of you to utilize the services provided by the university's employee assistance program. We want to ensure that everyone receives the support they need. And now if we could all just come together for a moment of silence. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Again, welcome to season two, episode one of ReggieCon, the con that asks the question, well, what's your story? Quickly, I'd like to acknowledge the people who helped make tonight possible. I want to thank Amelia Nova Elkins, Janet Albrecht, Danny Schroeder, uh, Sean Thornton, and Summer Simmons for all the work they do that actually makes these events possible. What I also like to do now is introduce the members of what's called the ReggieCon crew. This is a group of people who show up for all of these panels. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Dr. Teresa Rojas. Teresa, would you come on in, please? Uh, Teresa, if you could, please tell the audience a little something about who you are and as well as your favorite ReggieCon memory from last year. Yes, yeah, so thank you so much for having me. I love doing this. I'm Dr. Teresa Rojas, professor of English and the first professor of ethnic studies at Modesto Junior College here in California's beautiful Central Valley. I'm also the founding director of the Latinx Comic Arts Festival, the California Central Valley's only celebration of Latinx comic arts creators and friends. And I have two quick favorite memories. Um, of course, anyone who was here for our first ReggieCon panel will remember um, our Day Tripper panel when we discussed Day Tripper, um, when uh, one of the creators, Fabio Moon, joined us. Um, that was phenomenal. Such a surprise. And- Our star party. 
<laughs> yes, that was, <laughs> that was the start of the party right there. And then the final panel on uh, Miyazaki was super, super fun. And I really enjoyed just meeting everyone for that mm. panel. It was, it was one of my absolute um, favorite panel moments overall in, in doing this sort of work. So thank you for having me. Oh, we're so glad you're here and here for season two. Uh, now the next on the Regicon crew, the hardest working man in comics, Mr. Victor Dandridge Jr. Victor, would you please come in, tell the audience something about who you are, as well as your favorite Regicon memory? Of course, uh, I am the resident uh, phenomenological narratologist, as, as everyone has called me. I'm um, also a self-publishing comic creator from Columbus, Ohio, self-publishing through my imprint, Vantage and House Productions. Um, as, as far as my favorite memory of season one, it's really hard to mm. pinpoint a single instance. Um, what, I, what I can say is that it's actually a cumulative uh, kind of thought that when we started, it was a very fun, not necessarily passive, but kind of just a fun exercise. And as we've grown throughout uh, the year in, in doing so, so many of these, it's just been this like pinpointed educational exploration of media and that's really my favorite part is getting to you know kind of you know test my metal of sorts with with this amazing panel uh the regicon crew and really kind of seeing what sort of stories uh we can break down well we love having you as part of the crew so glad to see you my again pleasure. for season two i'm glad the contract negotiations worked out and, <laughs> and uh... absolutely and I'm, as you can see i'm representing as always there you go and now the last member of the Regicon crew, my friend, colleague, and partner in crime and all things nerdy, the one, the only Dr. Eric Wesselman. Eric, please uh, come on in, tell us a little something about who you are, as well as your favorite Regicon memory. So I'm Dr. Eric Wesselman, a social psychology professor at Illinois State University, uh, a fan of all things nerdy. Um, I most of my research focuses on uh, social inclusion and social exclusion, but over the last few years, I've been able to sort of grow as a scholar and move into other disciplines and sort of connect my love of popular culture media with my love of academia. So uh, my favorite Regicon memory, kind of like Victor, it's really hard to pick one. It's, you know, you could have asked me an even harder question. Who's my, you know, favorite child. Um, <laughs> So, I'm glad but, that's uh, a harder question, actually. Yeah, like, I'm really glad <laughs> we're already straight here, man. Um, but I think, yeah, it just um, very much is a series of, of peak moments that uh, I get to come here and talk with cool people about cool things, and I get to learn. So yeah. that's uh, an eternal student. Fantastic. And before we introduce our special guest for the evening, I'm just going to say, hard to pick. But my favorite Regicon memory was at the end of the last panel when we had a student come in and talk to us about what it meant for her to be part of all awesome. these Regicons. It was awesome. That's powerful. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce tonight's special guests. We are pleased to have with us this evening the co authors of Under the Cottonwood Tree, Paul Meyer and Carlos Meyer, as well as the illustrator, Margaret Hardy. Paul, Carlos, and Margaret, please turn on your mics and cameras and tell us something about who you are, as well as your favorite memory associated with this amazing graphic novel. And we'll start with Paul. Hello. Hi, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Um, I'm thankful to be a part of the second, uh, the second run of Regicon. This is very <laughs> cool. Um, quickly, a little bit myself, just like Victor down there. We are, uh, I'm self-publishing my books. I'm a Buqueño, uh, means I'm from Albuquerque, and I'm doing time in Los Angeles. Uh, <laughs> some, some people go to LA, but sometimes do time, some people do time in LA, so I've been doing time in LA. Um, favorite, one of my favorite moments uh, with creating Under the Cottonwood Tree, I just like to read something really quickly that was the date on it, it's an, it's an email response from a Craigslist ad. And the date, <laughs> June 23rd, 2011. Greetings. I'm a professional illustrator. Oh my God. Specializes. <laughs> my schedule is very open because she just came to LA. I had and, no job. <laughs> and, and my schedule is very open so I can focus my energy and on your graphic novel and create something exciting and beautiful signed margaret hardy lo and behold she did 
so yeah, that's just nine, awesome. nine years later. Listen, that's prophetic right there. That's what that is. That's a new favorite moment. Okay, Hold that that's into uh, to being. I love it. Those are the so, best emails. I'm not crying. You're crying. Great. Sometimes things are just uh, meant to be, and, and she exactly. was meant to answer that ad. So that's fantastic. We met at a star. We met at the Starbucks. Yes, because I'm like I don't know who this guy is. <laughs> he says he wants to make comics. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I, I remember. <laughs> I drove down the street right here in in Glendale, and because I'm over here in Atwater Village, and we end up in Glendale, and and I show up, and I'm like, wait, I thought you were a girl, and then like, oh no, this is oh you're okay. So there's a, it was your friend, your guy friend that showed up, um, but it was funny because we sat there and we're like. Have you made a comic book or a graphic novel before? And she's like, no. And then she asked me, have you made a graphic novel? No, me neither. All right. So how do we do this? It was That's literally fantastic. like, how do we do this? So when she got home, she just started a, a, a YouTubing and Googling, right? Well, yeah, I went to the Glendale Public Library and I got out like 20 graphic novels and comics and just like looked at them. I'm like, okay. Okay, six, five panels a page. Okay, cool, cool, cool. <laughs> like, I like how Fables does what they do. Maybe I'll just make a Fables. <laughs> oh my God. This just gives me life right now. Yeah. There you go. All right, why don't we go ahead and uh, introduce Carlos. Carlos, tell everyone a little something about who you are and your favorite memory of working on Under the Cottonwood Tree. Okay, hello everybody. I'm, uh, I'm thankful to be here. It's, it's, it's wonderful. This is my first first time participating in this kind of venue is ready to come and I thank I thank everybody but uh, I do want to give my condolences to to your your staff there mm -hmm. what they lost I do want to do that and, thank uh, you but my uh, my memories I, okay I'm coming from you from Albuquerque New Mexico I am a volcano I'm Paul well, I'm living here no. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, Paul and I a while ago we just well, Paul, are you uh, Angelino or are you uh, Brookenio? What are you? He, and he clarified it. So you clarified it for us. So you're not you're not an Angelino. You're no, Brookenio. I'm a Brookenio doing time in Los Angeles. There you go. Good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've had a lot of memories. The one of the good memories is is the evolution of this book. How it's it's just every step of the way. It's been a fun, a fun 15 year evolution. Or maybe mm -hmm. even 20 years when I first wrote the screenplay and then when the screenplay all came in. But there's the one I want to emphasize now is just uh, what's coming out of the woodwork is now we have the book out there. There's uh, people from all around the country that say, yeah, I used to live in, in uh, northern New Mexico or I used to live in southern Colorado. And even somebody said, I used to live in Anto Chico. And that's the, that's the village where my mom's from, Anto Chico, right next to Colorado. And out of the woodwork, everybody's coming and they're relating to it. And, we, and this book was meant for uh, middle school age, but adults are enjoying yeah. the heck out of it. A ninety-year-old, uh, our ninety-year-old aunt, she yeah. reads it and she really enjoyed it. So there's a lot more memories. I, but those are two I wanted to emphasize. No, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. And now, uh, Margaret Hardy. Margaret, would you please introduce yourself and uh, tell us your favorite memory? And it does not have to be the same as Paul's. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually uh, nine years after that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Margaret. Um, I, uh, I'm a professional movie poster designer, um, which I wasn't when I met Paul. Like, I moved out to LA. After I actually went to art school in Columbus. Ohio. What? You went to CCAD? Oh, yeah, I went to CCAD. Ah! <laughs> I, I, I did some well, time in CCAD as well. What's up? Okay. Yeah, woo. Instant, we're, yeah, we're, we're buddies now. <laughs> I went to Ohio State, Margaret. So That's yeah, right. It was close. Yay, it was close. Right down the road. Yeah, I love I loved Columbus. But a bunch of us moved out right after graduation because there weren't many jobs. Um, so I was trying to get into animation and um, I, I liked comics, didn't really know much about them. And I entered the Craigslist ad, learned a lot about comics. <laughs> mm. um, and I, I got hired uh, maybe like nine months after I moved out to LA. So I've been working full time. Like my, this is a pretty demanding job. Um, but Paul's been really, really patient with me. <laughs> mm. um, and finally, nine years later, uh, 
I guess my favorite, one of my favorite memories is going over to his house to sign books for the Kickstarter and seeing like the printed book, like feeling it, you know, in my hand, I'm like, wow, this feels amazing. And like opening it up, I'm like, this is so cool. It's like, I can see the evolution of my art and like, it kind of looks like a bunch of different artists worked on it. <laughs> and I, I did have some, some friends help me out with some panels and um, with coloring and all that. But yeah, just seeing the, holding the book in my hand and yeah, I think that's probably it. No, that's fantastic. Awesome. Thanks so that's much. Awesome. And we're so glad that we have the authors and the illustrator here. So I'm going to explain a little bit about tonight's format. Each of the members of the Regicon crew has come up with a favorite line, favorite scene, favorite frame, favorite character, whatever. Uh, they all chose uh, scenes or, or themes or frames from the book itself. So what I'm going to do is we're going to start with Teresa. I'm going to show you the frame that she picked. She's going to tell you why she loved it. Then I'll take it down and we'll all riff on a while for a while about why that is such an amazing so first of all, do you all see that frame? Yes, yes. we do. Yes. Okay, then Teresa, uh, please. Yeah, I want, so I want to say two things. First of all, it was incredibly difficult to choose just one page. Like, I mean, I, I've taught this book um, in my children's lit class and I'm teaching it um, this, this fall in a, in a seven week course. It's going to be the only book that we are analyzing for the entire class. The entire class is is um, going to revolve around this book. And I'm so excited about that. And I also want to say that I met Paul at the first comics event in Modesto in 2019. And at that time, Paul was promoting the Kickstarter. So the book didn't exist entirely yet, right? Yeah. Um, and that was the beginning that led, for me anyway, that led to this moment. And I'm so, I think that's so cool that it was Modesto. So like Modesto is a crossroads, if I can just point that out. Okay. Big <laughs> <laughs> like, shout out. Meet everybody. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Modesto and Columbus. There's right. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say some sort of vortex going it's on. It's an yeah, Einstein Rosen Bridge. That's what it is. Just, yeah. I, love well said. <laughs> I love this page as I, I'm reading the story. And then as I read it a couple times and I went back and um, this I pause every time I get to this point because of there's something with the this moment of like the food and we're in, we're in between scenes and um, let me just read what's going on here. So we have mm -hmm. the the first panel with the cooking and the cast iron uh, pan and then it says, "Boys, are you going to eat before you leave?" Um, and then they say, "Yeah, we'll probably grab something on the way out." And she says, "Mandy." Do you want something to eat or are you um are you going to sorry i can't quite read that are you going to something have, have supper, supper with mommy and daddy have supper with mommy and daddy <laughs> mandy and then she walks in and the boys are getting ready and she says e you think you put on enough cologne <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> that's like my whole life right <laughs> 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 and the cologne is every which where and it doesn't matter if it's grown men or you know like the teenagers or whatever anytime the guys are getting ready or they, they're arriving because they're going to <laughs> that cologne is it, it, it's its own character <laughs> i was like yeah man i was really reading it and every time i read it i'm like oh i can't smell anything but but it's that, that moment and the way that that it is juxtaposed with the first moment of the cooking and i didn't know at first what that was i was like oh is that is it tortilla is it is it buñuelo is I, I have all these foods running through my head i didn't really care i just wanted what was in that pan and so I'm like, are you eating? Wait, are we going back to the food? Because I'm hungry now. <laughs> I'm, now. I'm really hungry. And then, and then we, we switch over to the cologne. And I just thought, wow, like I can smell whatever is in that, in that cast iron pan. But then I can smell the cologne. And it's such a, a cool page that continues on the next page. But um, every time, every time it makes me stop and I'm like, oh, food, oh, cologne, oh, food, oh, cologne. And that's why I really love that moment. And that's all. Paul, Carlos, Margaret, right. any reactions to the smell? Well, I just want to say that the cologne does come into play 
later on in the book. Yeah. Because yeah. the, the dad is about to demolish. If it wasn't for the cologne. Wouldn't know that's who it was. <laughs> so that cologne saves the day. So Tree said, cologne saves the day. Character. It's more of the ways than one. <laughs> <laughs> and those are staples from our, in fact, a lot of the stuff, when you see mommy and daddy, we actually call, that's what we used to call our, our as adults, we call mommy and daddy. We yeah, call them yeah. that, yeah. So, and then the food that she's making, uh, that's, the, we had strong world mo uh, women mo role models in our life. And that's modeled after our oldest sister, Cindy. And she used to take care of us. She used to make uh, our tacos, our, our, uh, our either red or green chili tacos. And, and so, yeah, that, that comes from that. Yeah, I, it, it really was a, a slice. Those moments happened in our household every weekend, probably, because the older, so I'm, I'm nine of nine, so there's nine children. The older sisters uh, would be uh, helping take care of us, especially the younger ones, and they would be uh, making the food. And then, say, my brother uh, Sebastian or, or Dennis was they were getting ready for a date or something. So that's a slice of life scene right there. Mm, but we did need a little, and, and, and I'm glad Victor noticed that because it's a little plot point because you're a creator, you know that like this is going to do something. Got to see <laughs> that. You got to see it. <laughs> Foreshadowing comes that back. Cologne. She, that cologne. Yeah. Can I, can I, I ask, smell it, yeah. can I ask if that cologne scene was rewritten in any way after you got to the end and the cologne saved the day? In other words, was it did you know when you were writing that scene that the cologne was going to save the day or did it kind of get built back and forth it got built back and forth for sure yeah. we, mm -hmm. you, you realize like how is the dad the dad what if he what's going to prevent him from hitting these animals that are his one of them is his child so it's like right. uh, we need some sort of signal so we definitely when it, it was a back and forth and we figured out like it's little um it's little plot points and figuring out what works and what doesn't work type thing and that aha uh -huh moment when you go uh -huh. wait works. we could use this <laughs> exactly that, it's so interesting because uh smell is the most uh, uh intense memory sense yeah, that and sense uh, memory. <clears throat> it's chemical it goes directly to uh to the brain and it's i found it interesting that it's formed such a background for the family interactions and it also formed that saving background later um i, I think that's just fantastic i right? think narratively there's something really interesting when you're talking about the smell of vision aspect of that page you're you're going from food to cologne but everything about that is about fragrance and being in a place that's familiar and and something that you know so there's something very cool about you picking that that page Teresa. i really like that um now i'm kind of jealous about what i chose so i was going to mention something else about the, the flavors because the first frame is she's making tacos but later on it comes into play that those tacos are the the Tio Jose asked, are they red or are they green? Yeah. That's right. Meaning chili. And the right answer is Christmas. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yes. You know about it. Okay. You got Margaret. I was going to ask Margaret. <laughs> and you stole Margaret's thunder. <laughs> I'm <know>? sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> so someone now has to explain Christmas. Oh, Margaret. <laughs> Oh, no, you can explain Christmas. <laughs> so when you go into a restaurant in New Mexico, you're going to ask for red chili or green yes. chili. The, wait, the waiter will ask. And they specify red or green. Then you say, uh, no, I like Christmas. So yeah. red and green, colors of Christmas, it's, it's Christmas. <laughs> um, but I, I wasn't sure if they kind of came out looking like sopapillas. Did anybody know what sopapillas are? <laughs> yes. Oh, I love okay. sopapillas. Uh, yeah. So. Yes, that's a dessert, and it's a. Uh, if we're talking about the same thing, it's usually a fried flour yes. tortilla with cinnamon and sugar. Yep. You put a little honey on top. Well, I'm going to use this moment as to 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 uh, to uh, highlight New Mexico food. <laughs> New Mexico I'm food. okay with that. <laughs> okay, with this. Our, our food is, is, is simple ingredients, but sopapilla, we either eat, eat it with our meal or we eat it honey with the dessert. Like, for example, if you go to uh, in Albuquerque, if you go to Mary Tito's, uh, they're going to ask you, you got red or green, or Tomasitos and Tomasitas in Santa Fe, they can ask you red or green. And like, Victor, how did you know 
to answer correctly at Christmas. Uh, when we were talking about he cheated, the, the, man. Yeah, they we <laughs> oh, were going to talk oh, about oh, it he before, no, like okay. yesterday. You overheard what happened was <laughs> it was such a brilliant thing that I it just couldn't it just yeah, it stuck in it and it just came yeah. out just now. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. I was going to well, ask you when did when did you come to New Mexico? <laughs> it was magic. So, yeah, yeah, I was that's what it is. There you go. There you yeah. go. Yeah. Well, that Christmas to us so, earlier. As a reward for uh, Victor knowing about Christmas, we're going to move on to his favorite uh sequence. So I'm going to share the screen here and then Victor, please tell me what you want me to do with the images. Well, so to explain um, why this is my favorite sequence, first, I have to give all the roses for this being your first comic book project. Um, there, there are so many wonderful things um, that, that you experience for the first time when you're creating something like this. And in this moment, I think you arrived as a comic storyteller, both in terms of the writing and the art, because you, you stepped outside of the narrative and you did something like brilliant and drastic. I mean, you're talking, um, you know, very subjective art, flashbacks, the stark showcase of black and white, and then hitting the emotional punch of taking a character that throughout this story, we have been uh, projected and seen as the villain. And now we're actually getting some emotional content to almost explain away any mm. negative behavior that she has. This, this right here is one of the most pivotal points in the whole story because it makes everything make sense. It's not a, it's not about tropish characters at this point. Everyone is real. Everybody has a sense of their similitude to them that makes their, their actions, their rationalities so on point. So with this moment, um, I feel like it's, it's one of the most humanizing pieces in the whole book and it's heartbreaking. In, in the mm. best way possible. It's absolutely heartbreaking. Um, and to, if we can go to the next piece, to capture that crash had to have been a conversation. And I'm, I'm really curious as to how did you settle on visually articulating such an impactful moment and giving, I don't know, something like it, it gives enough information without being gratuitous or gorish in how it's expressed. And I'm really curious as to how you guys came to this conclusion. Because, I mean, this is worth celebrating right here alone. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, uh, thank you, Victor. Thank you for saying Welcome. that. Welcome. Really appreciate it. Um, boy, Margaret, this was, uh, this took a while, didn't it? Yeah, well, I think we, so the 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 piece with the the glass and the mirror changing mm -hmm. into the photo, I think mm -hmm. we, we re redid that a few times. Definitely. Um, and I, it's, it's so long ago. I'm like, remember, trying to remember. <laughs> <laughs> um uh i i remember uh for the page before that paul you you had it written out pretty clearly like the the scene is changing into the headlights right mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i just i took that and just kind of warped and played around with it and it turned out like that and i mean you gave some really good direction it it, it was it was it was um I wanted the subtleness of a transition i didn't want to i didn't want to be like some sort of flash cut mm -hmm. um and the genius of that scene though is Margaret's, because both her and I sat down and we're like, how are we gonna show a crash? Is it gonna be um, the actual car flipped over? And then she came up with this genius idea of just writing crash and then the lines emanating out from it. And just the, the it's like the moments and in the integral parts of a crash, the tire, the foot, mm -hmm the wheel, the one light, and I was like, oh, bang, she's got it. Um, and then we tr tried to transition back to the color uh, and showing the photograph. And then with just one hint of blood, which transitions into tears. Mm -hmm. So we want to see mm -hmm. that she's, she's uh, tearing up. So it was, uh, so Victor, it, it, was, it, it was a lot of uh, back and forth, but I think uh, uh, Margaret really, really figured it out at the end there. Absolutely. Um, worked absolutely. Out. Cool. You I guys did a wonderful job. I absolutely love this choice, Victor, because it's it's really um, illustrative, <laughs> literally, of <laughs> the, the, the two things that um, Margaret really captured in the art, and that is motion mm -hmm. and geometry. And not all comics do this well, True. but 
throughout the entire book, we see so much motion within the panels, across panels. And I love that. That is one of my favorite things about work that is done well is, is when you get that motion that not only carries you from panel to panel, which is important, but that allows you to linger. This is a great example in this, um, this part that says crash and the way the, the wheels are sort of sketched out and we have the, the flash and it allows you to linger. Like your eye wants to just go into this sort of um, this pool of lines. And I just think that's um, it's so dynamic and it creates that, that kind of um, geometry that really brings the story like pieces it together like like puzzle pieces absolutely so absolutely i appreciated that so much about this book yeah but this this one if i if i can add a little to that um this one is the sequence that i think really again shows that you understand what comics can do like it's one thing to want to tell a story but it's one thing it's something else entirely to tell it in comic form and this sequence seems to be in my head the one where you really got it because mm -hmm. you couldn't do this in any other media exactly. no you couldn't do it in a movie you couldn't do it in animation mm -hmm. it has to be comics where you can get this still image that when you see it you read it as a crash but then when you really look at it you see there's like four panels mm -hmm. in there that are separate aspect to aspect storytelling moments uh, like Paul said, it's the lights, it's the wheel, it's the, you know, it's the steering wheel, it's the tire, it's you're like all those things happening at once. Mm -hmm. This is where it's comics. This is where, you know, there is no other way that you can tell this story than this. And that is special. If I could quickly follow up on that. Um, <laughs> it, what I what I like about the way, what I really like about this is how time is manipulated by the shapes. So on the left hand, you have two traditional panels mm -hmm. that establish a certain present in that space. And then you have the dynamic crash scene behind it. And then when you go to the right, you see the glass crossing out of the panel, even though it's the same type of panel space as the previous. So you're in that present, but breaking out of that space is bringing you towards another present as the blood bleeds into our tears into the picture, which foregrounds that. Now you're in a new present and then suddenly you're in the present uh, right. with her, with the corner image and the color, all sort of managing the moment. And it, it's no, there's no work on my part really consciously required to get that message, right? Past, more, more present. And, I, and then the transition to color is just stunning. Absolutely love it. How about you, Eric? I don't really have much to add beyond what uh, what you've already said. So uh, no, that's okay. Um, I'd like to hear more from uh, our special guests who created it. Uh, there you go. Um, so I could, I could just say, in my role, Paul and uh, Margaret, Paul would send me the the panels, and uh, and I was amazed every time I would look at them. I was amazed, and just that 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 hint of the redness on the, the window pane panel. That, just that one little hint, I was blown away. So, wow, this, this, this tells a story, it tells. And by the way, that's the very next panel. Mm, mm, After that mm, whole scene, right? Yeah. Los Mio, Los Mio, yeah. So hey, Eric, how about you? We're gonna go to your uh, favorite frame. Take it away. Well, so like uh, many of uh, my colleagues here, it was hard to choose just one moment as I was reading it. I was enjoying multiple moments at different levels. So I, there was this sort of sen uh, sensory um, uh, assault of like the food and the cologne that uh, uh, Teresa mentioned. Um, I was, you know, reading some of the earlier moments where the, the siblings were kind of uh, going back and forth as siblings do, even in the midst of their transformations. Uh, which made me giggle. And I know my kids will giggle when I read it to them. Uh, but the one that really sort of hit me at my, I guess we'll say my psychological core, um, uh, because I study social relationships, um, is this particular moment here where, um, you know, we have uh, Senora Rios and uh, the mom Consuelo uh, talking in we have uh, Senor Rios, Rios saying, you know, where, where does a healer go when they themselves need healing? I mean, it's just such a, a poignant 
quote and then the response being to the people who love her. And, you know, this sort of highlights the interdependence that we have as, as, as social animals, you know, as people, we have a fundamental need to belong and a big reason for that is we need other people for social support, you know, to uh, be there for our joys and especially our sorrows, right? And so this, this sort of uh, hits that uh, nail on the head. Um, additionally, I'm an optimist at my core, even though that optimism has been sorely tested at several points these last few years, I'm sure you can all relate. Um, but hope is always something that I've really tried to cultivate in myself and focus on. And so that last line there from Consuelo, it's never too late to make a different choice, just really was a perfect ending for this, this uh, panel for me. This is such a great example too of where the writing and the art come together so beautifully. Um, if, we, if we look at, again, going back to this idea of the, of the geometry, I mean, like the skirt here, Margaret could have just drawn, you know, a skirt, a plain skirt, but there's motion in the skirt. There are wrinkles in the skirt, right? And I, I love that. And the face, the, the face has these, these shapes to it and darkness to it. And then the, the background, the doorway has the lines of darkness. And even the wood has some really cool motion and geometry to it. And then the the dialogue and this is throughout the whole book it's one of the things that's so impressive to me and one of the reasons that i i chose it to teach it is that the dialogue's really tight all throughout the whole thing and um this is a very emotional moment but it doesn't it doesn't um linger too long it's very direct you kind of get the feels <laughs> you're supposed to feel you know and then and then we move on and i and i just think that it's so effective in that Oh, that's Paul, awesome. Thank yeah, you. go ahead. Uh, I, I, that's, thank you for, for acknowledging. Uh, um, that's a huge compliment. Thank you so much, Dr. Rojas. Really appreciate that. Um, this is uh, Eric to recognize there's the poignant moment where um, w the collaboration that we had with Margaret, it, it, she was the cameraman, she was the sound woman, she was the, um, the acting. Uh, Margaret, you would look in the mirror and make that face, correct? I, like whenever I, I love drawing portraits, um, but I whenever I make I draw faces, I'm usually making the face, <laughs> 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 like to draw alone by myself, no one can see me. <laughs> did, did you find yourself being either depressed or sad writing some of these moments? Um, uh, trying something? Uh, well, I guess I just got into the story um, and tried to you know feel what they're feeling and yeah because you you want them to have the right expressions and all that and i was i was into it <laughs> as an actor would be right yeah exactly exactly I wanted this is... to say... oh, go ahead I, I just wanted to say that uh, you know as, as writers as paul and i you you write what you know you write what you grew up you write what you know and so we, we took aspects of new mexico that we knew we knew of the, of the curanderas from, from uh, New Mexico. We knew these two, Consuelo and Sosocoro, we saw strong women in our lives, our mothers, our aunts, our sisters, and, and that's, that's, that's what, the, and we saw their back and forth. <laughs> I see my, my Aunt Mela and my, my mom, Concha, they would, they had this type of relationship back and forth, so, so we, a lot of this aspect that we drew is, is stuff that we know. From a from a writer standpoint, this is okay. This is walk with me on this one. So one of the things that that I aim for in my writing is to fail better than I ever did before um, on every new project. And you guys said that this was meant for a middle grade reader group, like middle school is the is the aim. In that panel, you failed for middle grade and oh, elevated no. for the entire world. Like, I love that. like, no, seriously, because there is an honesty, <laughs> right? Like it's, it's a fail harder, fail better is what that did because you actually have phrasing there that is so honest that I would never, I would never imagine even an adult yeah, yeah, yeah. being that honest, you know, yeah. I hurt people and it made me feel good. Uh, yeah. That's a level of honesty that, yeah. yep everyone should strive for especially wow. as they are trying to make amends trying to atone 
for what they've done. Like she hit it, she hit a place that you're just like, as a grown up, I'm like, I need to do better. Mm. I need to do better. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, wow. Like yeah. I need to do better. And and I think that first line, where does a healer go when they need healer? That could be as iconic as who watches the watchman. Mm. I'm, I'm putting yeah. that out there, there for you. you. It is that level of, of iconic. Oh, thank you. I, that out I'm going to, I'm going to run with that. <laughs> yeah, please, please. That's the byline. Yeah. Put some yeah, miles on really, that one. I really like how she's so brutally honest. And in those moments of honesty, it's 100% who you are. Mm. And I love the recognition that it takes another human being to provide mm -hmm. her the opportunity she, yeah. to, to, for something different. She can't experience that alternative by herself. Right. So, so it takes someone else and you know, that's life, you know, and that's why other people are important as well. Eric, high five for that choice, bro. That's good. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and move on to my choice real quick. Um, it's, well, I'll just let it speak for itself. Um, so um, this is a scene where they're asking um, what is the golden cottonwood leaf? And I'm, I'm just going to read the dialogue here. Uh, um, look out for each other, you two. Uh, Cindy, have you ever heard of a golden cottonwood leaf? And sure, I've heard of it when I was about your age, which automatically renders the belief in the cottonwood leaf magic to childhood, right? And then you have it said to be the essence of the bosk or the fruit of its soul. I'm not too sure. They say it's like pure magic, but it's only a legend. Why do you ask? And what? As someone who's interested in narratives about what reality is, you know, when we're uptight, we call it ontology. Um, what I love is what these types of stories do for our thinking about what reality is. And on the one hand, um, it's the essence of the bosk or the fruit of its soul. That's a way about talking about where reality is. It's a way of believing that reality is inherently meaningful, that mm -hmm. even the leaves have meaning. And I think for me in the culture that I work in as a scholar and as a human being, um, in Western culture, uh, scholarly culture, we tend to start with the idea that reality is physical and inherently meaningless. And then somehow we need people or organisms or something to bring meaning to reality. But what I love about this way of thinking is that no reality is meaning from top to bottom dare I say, reality is meaning, and then life isn't so much finding it, but managing it, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I just love when these scenes come out, and people might read them and just have it go on in a, in a passing and think it's not important to the story. But for me, it's always just important to get that way of thinking out into the world. Wow. And uh, I love it. Wow. How deep is this book, man? I know. <laughs> I really, I really so much about this book. It's so beautiful. This book. Well, I, but you did, you did bring something out because playing in the Bosque, everything had the reality that the big cottonwood trees used to bake tree houses on, the, the, the leaves. And uh, in fact, in one, uh, we're up on Iris' book, Bless Me Ultima, his was a golden carp. That there's the, the golden carp that come. But ours, yeah, this a big. Come with my gold come with you. Yes. That was our childhood play. That was our childhood playground, basically. Yes. But, <laughs> but I, I, I love that you brought that out because it's always fascinating to see what other, what the reader yep. gets from it. Because I mean, these are just words, <clears throat> and you throw that to the reader, and it's really what their brain makes of it. So that mm -hmm. it's, it's always interesting to see what a, a reader, uh, how a re reader reacts. Um, because I mean, sound. The sound really exists, but when it gets into your ear, it's just the vibrations, and then your brain has to interpret what that vibration is. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it reality is made in your head. So um, I didn't know you were going to go there. Awesome. Wow. <laughs> well, this is I suspect, some insightful stuff. It's, it's I oh, suspect yeah. everybody else on the Regicon crew knew where I was going to go with that because <laughs> that tends to be how I talk. I all I can say is that twenty percent of the world's population lives in cultures that believe in meaningless reality. And 80% of the world's cultures believe in a reality full of imbued with meaning, made of meaning, different realms that the Western world might call stories as if somehow the things we say in the Western world aren't stories. Mm. And uh, I, I just love things that draw our attention to the fact, I would argue the fact 
that we have to live in stories. We forever live in stories or we can't be so much. So I just love the work, bringing it out and getting it into the conversation because wow. that, that's where I live and think. Do you think that there is a, a westernization of that story belief, which is why she's like, well, when I was your age, I yes. believed in it. But now, no. And that's why his response, as he's trying to assume being older, is like, oh, nothing. I didn't, I didn't mean anything by that question. Yeah. No, you're, you're absolutely right. Being trained not to believe in reality right. is being inherently meaningful. We, we say things like, well, that's magic. Well, right. you know, if it's meaningful, it's not magic, it's reality. So you know. to not express that childhood belief in magic, right? right. There, it's the same thing with like drawing when we're um, the whole like Linda Berry expresses this all the time that when we're when we're young, we're allowed to draw, we're allowed to draw whatever. It doesn't have to look like anything because we're mm -hmm. drawing, we're kids. But but at some point you reach the age where you realize that there's judgment involved and it's yeah. not okay mm -hmm. to just draw stick figures. How well did you do it? Right, yeah. it has to look like something. It ha you have to be able to express yourself artistically yeah. so that it's understandable to uh, some invisible audience and so we lose that sense of magic we lose that that particular reality and we lose that innocence yeah. it's well true. We human off... imagination paid for itself hundreds of thousands of years ago when we figured out how to keep that fire going one mm -hmm. night to the next to the camp that's imagination that's right to reorganize right. reality and make it happen that's what yeah. stories do and that, that's why i love when we start talking about that as magic we we start the book off with with a storyteller and what every everyone yep. everyone's got a story and 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 in cultures it's always about the storyteller and th this is a uh, this is from the Puebloan because uh, in New Mexico we we're right with the Puebloans Indians we're right with uh, our grandmother our great grandmother was uh, Hickory Apache yes. um, but this is from the Puebloan I mean, you barely see it but she is the storyteller yes right it's the famous mm -hmm. Puebloan yeah. Uh, sit yeah. Oh, so it, it's the um, but we we want to start off with innocence. You know, we this is this is Carlos and I grew up in a very uh, uh, magical uh, world of our our older our grandmother um, uh, telling stories to us, but having adventures in in the forest, <laughs> and that's where innocence takes place. So yes. that's where we mm -hmm. start off. part of the reason I wanted to work on the book because um. Paul was kind of describing it as like a like Wizard of Oz, like forest fairy tale. I'm like, I mean, I played in the woods all the time with my brothers growing <laughs> up, and that's all I want. Like, that's like my favorite memories, and like I, I also love drawing organic shapes. <laughs> you do it very very well. Yeah, so I'm like magical tree forest. Yes, please. <laughs> there were a lot of scary forest scenes too. It was very cool. Yeah. I love scary awesome. forest scenes. Yeah. Um, Amelia, can you tell me if we have any questions? Uh, so Trinity Bear says, this is long and I apologize. I've been anticipating season two since the end of the last spring <laughs> session. We're going to go for an Emmy soon, guys. Uh, <laughs> speaking more directly to the authors and illustrator, the panel that Eric Wesselman chose also hit me the hardest. I think that interaction is so important for readers, especially young readers to hear, to know that they don't always have to be strong, that they are allowed to go to the people who love them for help. With the concept of la digna de la, oh, I'm sorry, I brought, um, la digna de la vergüenza, dignity and shame, yep. being so ingrained in Hispanic culture, as well as just being a shared human trait. What does this panel mean to each of you personally, as well as in relation to the culture that it comes from? Great question. Wow. Man. Wow. I see you, Trinity. I see you. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, a very insightful question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Maybe uh, uh, Dr. Rojas would like to. I mean, because I, you, because culturally, oh. it, Hispan your Chicanas are important to you, correct? Well, yeah, because I am one. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, was, I was trying to just say it more eloquently, but it came out. Right. <laughs> I totally get. I totally get what you're saying, and um, interestingly enough, this question makes me think about not so much that specific panel, but um, something that stood out to me about the book that we haven't talked about yet that I think is important that we, that we take some time with. And that is that this, this book 
includes a glossary and notes in the back. This is another, if I can just say to the graphic novelists out there, if you want to get your book in schools, man, especially in colleges, give it a glossary and some notes because that is, you know, fodder for all kinds of stuff. But the glossary in particular was, was so important to me because as a Chicana, there are Chicanas and, you know, there are Chicanos and Chicanos, which means Mexican American. But what it means to, for me in California and what it means for you guys in New Mexico is a little different. Mm. And, and what I noticed is that the language from the very beginning, we have the word um, uh, ijola with an A, right? Yes. I don't know yes. if you see exactly the same, like we would say ijole. So do you we say- We talked ijole? about that, yeah, we talked about that. <laughs> as soon as that came up, I was like, oh, typo. <laughs> and oh. I'm like, no way. <laughs> Yeah. No, wait, then I saw it again and I'm like, I wonder, and I immediately went to the back. I'm like, glossary, yes. yes, yes. <laughs> so, and, then, yep. and, and it's just wonderful to have that because as a reader, there, there are like mul these multiple experiences happening where as a reader, I'm picking up new, new vocabulary in general, maybe I don't know Spanish. And you can really shut out some readers with your choices, with your rhetorical choices of whether to code switch like this and, mm -hmm. and use um, Spanish and English and whether or not you use a glossary or if you like disrupt the reading a little bit by putting it right in the panels. So that's a that's a choice. A, um, we talked about thing, that, yeah. Yeah, and that's, and I, and I wanna hear about that. Um, but the other thing is that as a Chicana, as a Mexican American, as a scholar reading this book, I'm so interested. All of a sudden, I'm like, oh, wait a minute. My experience growing up Mexican American in California is not, it's not universal, right? There is, there is all this, all this other language that is introduced that I just was so fascinated by. And by having the glossary, I'm like, I'm not crazy. Wait, it's, it's here. <laughs> it's discussed here. So I would love to hear more about those those that, choices. Sure. We, 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 we really, we. Well, we I could just, when, Cal, when Paul first moved to California, he even that, he said, oh, they say Ijole over here. They say Ijole. He said, wow, I've never heard that before. I thought it was Ijola. <laughs> and then there's a lot of, there's a lot of words that, uh, that we're, we're teaching, like back to your friends, uh, the Camargas, what do you call it? Camargas? Camargas, you comment? Yeah. <laughs> They love that work, Alamodis. Alamodis, mm -hmm. and that's Alamodis. Yeah. Where does that word come from? It's it was just our vocabulary growing up. There's a lot of yeah. We 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 really try to bring uh, um, uh, specificity is authenticity, right? So we really wanted to um, uh, have the language specific to northern New Mexico and southern Colorado. So I like to call it the the pocket culture. Um, so it's. I did, one of my favorite quotes is from Levi Romero. He was a state historian uh, or a poet laureate. And he says, the orphan ones whom Spain abandoned, Mexico did not adopt and the U.S. never wanted. So that, that says a lot right there. He, like, and, and so Professor Rojas's experience in California is, is different and yet the same, but uh, as our experience in New Mexico, we're, we're in the macro um, Mexican, but in the micro New Mexican. Yeah. Um, and so there's there's specific little language uh, uh, differences that that is uh, regionalisms that we really wanted to uh, to get correct. And we consulted with uh, um, Nazario mm -hmm. Garcia, uh, who, who's a famous uh, folklorist in New Mexico. And, and we're like, hey, how does this does this word work? Does that word work? But yeah, it's funny. The Ijula, we, we were really like, wait a minute, I've been in L.A. so long. Is is what's the what's the way that I grew up? And I'm like, no. When I go back home to Albuquerque, my older sister still says, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, okay. So that, that's, that's correct. But we wanted to, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 a la modis, a la machina. A la modis, a la machina. Carlos, maybe you can say how, how, how sapo is used. Oh, in, in okay. Yeah. I just wanted to, uh, yeah, there's a lot of, of, of words that are used specifically here in New Mexico. There's uh, well, we've got Nasario Garcia said, well, he was too busy to actually make the glossary, so he suggested we hire uh, an Aaron Taylor. We thought, well, this, he has an, an angle last name kind of like us, but is he Hispanic like us? <laughs> mm. And so we met him, and sure enough, mm. he's from northern New Mexico. He's uh, 
But we asked him this, this one word. He says, okay, uh, there's one word. And if you get this word correct, well, you can write the glossary for us. He says, okay, <laughs> if you, what is the word sapo mean to a, a New Mexican in Northern New Mexico? And he knew the answer. He says, it means lucky. It means lucky. Ah. It's like, in fact, for example, I was, uh, I'm a, a, ba a big basketball fan and, uh, our New Mexico Lobos are playing the Nevada Wolf Packs. And the next day, the, the Lobos lost. But the next day on, on top radio on the sports animal, they were saying, oh, Nevada, they, they just, all those people were shooting three pointers and they soppled. They were a bunch of soppled shots. But okay. literally, soppled means frog. So I, yeah. <laughs> I asked them, what does, where does this word, how does this derive? How, how did the word derive? And there was a historian, her name was Carmen Garcia from Mora, from Mora, New Mexico. It's, and she says, well, this is the, the tale that along the Dianas River in Las Vegas, New Mexico, there was, there was a, little, a lot of kids catching, boys catching frogs and catching toads. And they would catch them and they'd take them home. But every so often, a toad would, would escape. And, and they would just, when they'd escape, they, they said, supple. But all of a lucky. sudden, it, it, yeah, that, that frog got lucky. And oh, so it yeah. turned into just lucky. Yeah. Wow. That sounds like the beginning of the next book to me. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it it frogs. Sounds like the, the next the frog book. escapes, but you actually find out it was actually turned into a frog using a little kid. Yes. <laughs> oh, right to what himself. A, what a song. Yeah. As long as we get some authorship here, we're good. <laughs> okay. We'll include you guys. <laughs> So what I want to do now is ask the guests if they might have any questions of us. I mean, we've, we've given you our responses to the, to your amazing text. Um, please. I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind asking. I, I'm so grateful that comic books as a medium, and, and I'm sure Victor is grateful too, has been embraced by academia. It didn't used to be this way when, Right. When did this start 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 happening? I, I don't remember this as a kid, because they, they were they were always kind of like, that's just that's that's kid stuff. But when mm -hmm. did it get serious? 2015, when Eric and I went to Wizard Con. <laughs> <laughs> it's because of you, Nick. <laughs> <Started Yeah>. everything. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. When I so I started grad school 2009 ish, yeah, 2009, and um. And that was for my PhD because I already had a master's. And I remember um, going to my advisor around then, maybe 2009, 10. And um, I said, look, this is what I want to study. I want, I want to, I'm really into autobiography, visual culture, feminism is a big thing, literature, of course, because I'm in English. And there was one other thing I can't remember, but I remember there were five and she was like, hmm. And then he handed me Alison Bechtel's Fun Home. Mm. And he said, this is what you're looking for. And I was like, this is a comic. A <laughs> 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 um, graphic memoir. And I was just like, I'm, I'm going to trust him because he's you know, very big in his field, super nice. This is the kind of person who you'd go into his office and say, I'm, I want to uh, I don't know. And he would, you know, he'd go, well, it sounds like you want to compare the blah, blah, and this and that. And I was like, yeah, that's what I said. And so you come out sounding brilliant. So I trusted him. I took this, I took this um, graphic novel and it just, you know, blew my mind. And from there, I started studying narrative theory and, you know, all these other, um, you know, autobiographical theory and stuff. And then I realized, wait, I can do this in, in grad school. And that, you know, the visual culture of all these things came together in comics. That comics have all these possibilities. And at Ohio State, very luckily, there was a whole group of people and then a whole community in Columbus mm -hmm. who are just like comics. There's the Billy Ireland um, um, Comics, the library and museum there. And now here I am in, in uh, Modesto and I have a dean who I'm like, hey, let me start a festival. And she's like, whatever that means, you know, <laughs> like, do it. I will support you. And here we are. So awesome. yeah, it is, it is talk about magic. Yeah, yeah. Here we are. Yeah, it's definitely been a slow road, but it keeps like leaping forward. 
um, particularly when people are looking at not just the traditional aspects of education and how comics fulfill that, but then when you get to a cultural uh, sophistication about it, I mean, Under the Codwood Tree is a cultural story that in so many ways is necessary to be told in comics form in order for people to understand it like it needs to be understood. So when you when you look at it as not just this vehicle to entertain kids, but one that is very specific for how you can understand a story, you know, when it can be very specific, the scholarly community has to go, wait, there's something to this. This isn't something we can just kind of shrug off now because, you know, as culture has, has moved forward and happened, other forms of media are, are ripping from what comics have been doing for decades. And when they realize that, it's like, well, we got to give some more credence to this thing because, you know, so much is already pulling from it. So, yeah, yeah it's just kind of catching up. And Scott yeah. McCloud famously argued that <clears throat> when we read comics, we're engaging in this thing called filling in. You know, if we were having a long conversation, I'm arg- I'd argue we're filling in all the time. And what comics are, are these this fantastic tool, simulation, way to see, can I get people to fill in as a writer what I want them to fill in? And then through that process, bring them to moments like some of the moments you created here. So it really is a unique form of communication. Um, and, you know, as a nerd, it's fantastic mm-hmm. that things I loved earlier in my life have kind of come full circle. And the things that I like to talk about, like narratives about reality and human anticipation, um, are now being applied to studying this medium. Because, you know, you can watch a movie, but as, as Victor said, everything's filled in. You can make edits. Yeah. But yeah. this exercise of filling in is, is this interesting kind of crossword puzzle of imagination that we engage mm-hmm. in. And uh, if you're good at it, you can get people to fill in what you want. You know, you can get them to move through the story. And that's a craft. So I just love it. For, for me, it, it feels as, as a comic book reader, you're more of a participator you you, you mm-hmm. feel like you're this is this is something you can hold and like margaret was saying when it was it was finally done you can hold this you know this is this is tangible and it, as a comic book reader and writer i appreciate the the uh the participation of a comic book but I, again i was the kid that that i wasn't the the smartest kid i wasn't the best athletically so you would find me in the library in, in middle school escaping but i wasn't able to escape uh into the books because oh that's going to take forever to read but i was gravitating mm. towards the uh the comic books where i could i like you remember heavy metal uh nope. yes yeah. oh, okay. <laughs> i was like Absolutely. so I, I i'd escape to the library and find that heavy metal or the or the um <laughs> or the epic i think there another anthology was epic and and like all right okay the next thing you know lunch is over i can go back to uh to school but yeah i'd escape into the library all the time no. that was so me that was yeah, so yeah, me. totally we have a question from isabella Trujillo. she says thank you for highlighting new mexico culture and presenting it to a broader and larger audience how have non-new mexicans and nuevo mexicanos alike received the book oh you guys just answered that question by the way you you elaborated your your response of non-new mexicans Look at the look at you guys. It, I, and I appreciate that. This is this is an insightful discussion. I stuff that I I really enjoyed hearing. It it, it, it yeah I, I agree. And this is look where we are. You know it, we're in Ohio. We're also in Missouri. Um, so thankfully it has um, uh, people from all around the country are 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 getting a little bit of a the magic of the forest from New Mexico. So I really appreciate that. As far as the New Mexicans, the um, the older generation are really gravitating towards it because it's some of the words that they grew up on and that really doesn't exist anymore. Um, we really try to capture mm-hmm. a time and place and a culture that was my mother, our mother's uh, generation, the 1940s, uh, 1950s of, of these little villages that only spoke Spanish. They, they weren't, this is, it's been America for, for a while now, but they were only speaking Spanish. My mom didn't speak English until she went to the schools and she was like, oh, what is this, what is this foreign, mm. foreign language? So the, uh, the old timers in Mexico, I really appreciate it. And thankfully 
uh, the school systems in New Mexico are are it's being taught in in uh, in right next to uh, Rodolfo and I as uh, bless me Ultima. So we're yeah. we're we're appreciated that it's it's appreciated. That's amazing. I, I have a question, if I may, about process because I'm a process nerd, mm -hmm. and um, I really want to know from from the script writing. Carlos was saying that he was you know conceptualizing this um, quite a while ago to finding an artist to the actual like. Um, Margaret, your process, like, I know people want to know, you know, what do you use to create the art? And, and you know, like, if it's digital, what, what programs are you using? What, and if it's not people, it's me. So if you can <laughs> talk about that a little bit, please. Uh, sir, oh, uh, the art process? Um, it's mo almost all on Photoshop. <laughs> mm. Um, I did do a lot of pre-sketching. Um, if you bought, if you have the hardcover, it has some of the concept art in it. Right. Um, and, uh, I got so much reference from Paul. Like, so I still really haven't explored New Mexico. <laughs> 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 I was going to go in 2020, but then COVID the secrets hit. out. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, I was given so much amazing reference. Like Paul, they, he gave me, um, photos of family members to base the characters on. Mm. Um, I did a lot of Googling. Um, I, when I'm working, I constantly, I have all the reference, like I make a, a, an extra file and just put it all in there. So I'm looking at it the whole time. Sometimes I'd have like two computer, like another computer with all the reference. Um, mm. So, um, but I did most of it in Photoshop. First, I just had a tablet and then I got a Cintiq. You can, there's a part in the story where the lines get a little less wobbly. <laughs> <laughs> that's because i was actually drawing on the screen <laughs> and it's fantastic uh, yeah um and and we, oh we had um uh jc yeah uh, helped block it out um because yeah. it was it was a lot of work it it, it was taking me so long so we had yeah. a oh pod do you want to talk about that oh, uh, the uh the coffee that we had at Starbucks that day, we were thinking, yeah, a few more Starbucks meeting, we'll, we'll be done with this. But no, we had, we had, we had no idea it would be, it'd take this long. Well, so you sweet babies, you sweet babies. <laughs> I, signed, I signed up and the script wasn't done. He's like, Paul's like, oh, I'll be 100 to 120 pages. I'm like, okay, cool. And then, and then he was like, actually, it's 168. <laughs> like, Both of thought. which are operas. So, I mean, that's. <laughs> Uh, but thankfully, at the end there, uh, we recruited uh, um, my buddy, J.C. Crawl, who's an awesome artist himself. And what he did is he uh, did the rough panels, uh, probably like the last half of the book. And then Margaret would take the rough panels, start inking them. And then and then she had her friend, Daniela Law, come in and, and do a little bit of the of the coloring. So it was it was a little bit of assist at the end. But yeah. Besides those assists, it, it's a one woman project. She she's a one woman crew. Uh, so that yeah, yeah. No, it's awesome. absolutely absolutely. Well, what I enjoy about what you're telling us is um, I love the recursive nature of creating. In other words, yeah, we can get this done in you know, three months, <laughs> man. And then you write a few sketches and then you redo them and then you redo yeah. them and then you redo yeah. them. And I've always wanted to, to see a book of all the art that wasn't shown. Oh, right, yeah. you know, all the you know, I've always wanted to ask, like for example, Hayao Miyazaki, what are the ideas that ended up on the floor? Yeah, right. That that That's we never a movie saw. unto itself, yo. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. On the way to getting to this, because you know, um, creation is so much an act of creation and destruction, but you can't mm -hmm. reorganize until it's in front of you, mm -hmm. and you can actually bring destructive powers in your own brain i know that sounds weird but you can actually take the image in and reorganize it in your brain in ways you can't do in memory so mm -hmm. you got to put it out there yeah. you get to re and i just love that story is not told enough about creation right we all think picasso just had an idea mm -hmm. and a boom it came out and then you see his sketches and it's like yeah okay whatever you say <laughs> there, there are so many panels that um i wanted to go back and redo especially after I got my new computer and I, I felt like I, like the last few pages, I was like, oh, I finally feel like I know how to do this. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and, and like, I, I'm like, there's no way I cannot go back there and redo all these panels. Mm. But I kind of, I kind of do enjoy looking through it because you definitely see the progress. Um, mm -hmm. And I can, I like, I listen to so many podcasts and audiobooks for working on this. Like I look at a panel, I kind of remember what I was doing <laughs> while making that <laughs> panel. Like, yeah. yeah, it's like a time capsule almost. Yes. 
Yeah. So we have a. Me when ahead, I sir. paint as well. I paint and then I'm listening to like, there's a painting here uh, that yes. I was listening to Doug the Bounty Hunter the whole time. And it's like, <laughs> oh my God. So every time I look at that piece, I'm like, oh, Doug the Bounty Hunter. I, love <laughs> I, love totally, I totally get that. Every song has a smell. Every painting, you know, there's yep. things that were yep. going on, you know. Absolutely. Exactly. So we got, uh, we have another question from uh, someone named Anonymous Attendee. How do you see young Hispanic Americans identifying with this piece as well? Because you mentioned that, you know, older, older persons are identifying with it. Well, we can use uh, an example of uh, the schools that have been adopting it for their classroom work. The school E in Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, one of the elementary schools, the fifth grade class, they, uh, that was one of their, in fact, Paul, you can elaborate e much better. E.J. Martinez is a, uh, is a school in Santa Fe, and we did a Zoom meeting with them, and it was, it was great because even if the children didn't speak Spanish, some of them, a lot of them did, they could still, it, it's all about the family dynamics mm -hmm. and the um, um, kids, families, either brothers picking on each other or brothers having, or families having adventures and they could all relate to it in some way or another. It just happens to be Hispanic. And I'm hoping that um, they see themselves, you know, they, they, the, the, uh, the ones who do know that culture can see themselves. Because again, when, when I was a kid, I was growing up and I'm like, where is the Chicano Wizard of Oz or the, or the Hispanic never ending story? You know, That's what so, this is for me. Oh my God, I'm so glad you said that. Oh. Uh, that, that's what we set out to do is is like all right this is if we can't we we can we can we can get it out there in in a in a book form and all right here is a chicano never ending story one of my favorite movies i was a kid i love that movie mm -hmm. I, I like paul and i just became best friends welcome <laughs> <laughs> i like to use an example of i went to go visit my uh, my sister and her her grandchild named katie he's uh, i think he's only like seven or eight he didn't know I, I don't think he knew I was one of the authors but he was he had that book right there and he was he was he wanted to show me the whole book he wanted to show me the changudo or he wanted to show me the tree monsters and he was like a seven-year-old boy but he was this is was his thing he would they said he had read, read, read it this is it's teaching him how to read this book yeah, and yeah. you became the coolest student in the world. Yes, of course. Yeah. 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 Of course. Yeah. Wow, I wrote it. Of That's course. Awesome. That's awesome. Now, I, I do have a personal question. Um, Carlos, how oh, no. much like Carlos are you to the world? <laughs> or is that actually Paul of the mix here? Let's <laughs> let's be honest here. It's a combination, I think. Combination. I think Paul, it, it, uh, it, but nah, let's let's be honest. Uh -oh. Uh, uh -oh. <laughs> oh no, it's a common. Yeah. I, I think I think Kippy or uh, or his actual name is Kevin. Mm -hmm. um, he was the uh, the adventurer in the trees that were he, yes. he was breaking bones all the time because he'd be jumping from tree branch to tree branch. So in my mind, Carlos is definitely Kevin. That's 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 me. Uh, I don't sure. know. Do you think is Kevin? Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, he was the adventurer, just one. He would building tree houses. Uh, he was or, exploring or yeah. lighting fireworks inside the bedroom. <laughs> oh no, that was that was Sebastian. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> now we're snitching. Now we're snitching. Oh, no. I hope never he's not met listening before. to this. You know, none of my brothers are listening to this podcast. Yeah. It, <laughs> I, I want to do a shout out really quick to um to the children of uh, of EJ Martinez because. This blew me away. They made a newspaper, uh, like it was a, um, it was a, I guess it was their class project, but they did a report and of like, hello, Chigualo, how, how did you feel about the battle with the trees? And then the trees chimed in. It, they did like a whole interview newspaper, and I was like, I was blown away. I can't believe this. this Actually, that was uh, when you sent me that. That was one of my favorite moments of working on the comic, like having fan art from. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> 
I was I blown it. away of, of the ingenuity. It was so like, funny. Who, who thought of doing that? They were interviewing the monsters. It was, it was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> the monsters. Yeah. Uh, the cool kids of the book right there. Oh, yeah. Of course, man. I mean, good imagination gets good imagination. That's exactly. good uh, stories get good stories. That's just how it works, right? So that's fantastic. And isn't that the one of the wonderful things about art and about letting go of your project, finishing your project and letting it go is then when yes. it's in the world, it's not yours anymore, right? Exactly. And, and the folks who are consuming it, especially productively consuming it, are turning it into other forms of art and doing all kinds of things. So in my class, we, in the, the children's lit class, we, um, we drew, I had them draw their favorite character and oh, then awesome. analyze their own rhetorical choices. Why did you draw it this way? Because not everyone, they didn't draw it exactly like they saw it. Some, some would take, you know, Carlos and then um, do different sort of morphing things. I should share those with oh. you. Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then discuss why they, they did that because they think, well, actually, you know, the, the secret is this is going on and i'm like oh there are secrets there are more secrets. Uh -huh. i don't know about the secrets da, 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 da. and it's so cool to see that because then your art is um it, it's you know elevated and expanded and it becomes something completely um different and, and just incredibly cool and it's again awesome. apparently i'm a fan of this book i don't know if you noticed <laughs> <laughs> thank you love it love it uh, yeah well the other, and that but go ahead Teresa. oh i was just gonna say the other thing and this is me it sounds like a silly thing but the other thing that i appreciate so much about this book that i want to say to every single comic arts person in the universe page numbers for the love of everything beautiful put page numbers in your books if at all possible i understand the complications with adding pages and all of that but but in the end if you put page numbers, you make it so much easier for folks like me, mm. for scholars, for my students mm. to, to turn this into, you know, scholarly work and reference. Otherwise, it's just no page, no page, <laughs> which means nothing. Oh, find it. Feel where it is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> section one-ish. It's, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's that had picture. A, uh, Margaret yeah. and I had an adventure with, with the oh numbers, my gosh. right? It's, yes. We, we got our proofs back from the printer, and there were no numbers. Oh. And it was, for some reason it was buried below the layers, and we're like, oh. and and Mar and we're thinking like maybe it's fine. And I remember thinking, no, because you know why? Librarians and teachers love the page numbers. Mar oh. I, did, I wasn't thinking about that. I'm like it's too, it's too much. It's too crazy. And Paul was like, no numbers. <laughs> and I numbers. yelled. <laughs> I said, please numbers. Well, yeah, you're, really, number. you're always very nice about it. <laughs> I have to choose between two books and one of them has page numbers no. and the other one doesn't, you know, which one I'm choosing. So I'm writing that down. That's, that's I, I numbers. Did, I <laughs> numbers. writing that down too. <laughs> and when we get to Regicon and Scott asks the Regicon crew for their favorite panel, the page. You gotta have a page number, man. Otherwise <laughs> right? I can't find it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I want to quickly ask Amelia and Jana, um, are there any administrative mm -hmm. details we need to take care of at the moment as we get close to bringing the panel to an end? No, Scott, I think we're good. We have um, two links in the chat if people need to uh, get credit for their classes. There's a link in there that they can use. And of course, if they want our fabulous merchandise from the Regicon store, the link's in there too. Listen to oh. that voice, man. Who are you going to go buy now? What's that? Voice. <laughs> I got to get one of uh, one of the shirts like Victor's wearing. I, I'm going yeah, to go on that. the website. Yeah, look at that. Wow. Guys, I'm going to brag on my kid. My kid made these shirts. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. This oh, is yeah. vinyl. Wow. wow. Yeah. This is vinyl, man. Cool. Yeah, this is fantastic. I should have worn mine. I have a red one, just so everyone knows. Oh. Wow. <laughs> um, cool. So, yeah, as we get as we get, uh, you know, close to the end, I do want to just comment on my notion of st stories and stories about reality. and filling in the blanks and when we're sitting here reading stories and we're reading stories that force us to fill in the blanks what are we filling in the blanks about other people what other people are thinking and what they're going to do so these books are actually not just entertainment they're tools they give people the opportunity to practice thinking about what other people are going to do which people do all the time and don't even know that they're doing and then the beauty of practicing something of this quality is that you can have an impact on steering what they might think other people are like and what they think other people are do. You can influence 
how they fill in their blanks. And that's kind of the point of Regicon is to practice filling in the blanks in ways that we can all mutually respect. Um, so with that, I'm gonna ask the Regicon crew if they have any final questions or comments. We have about probably five minutes or so. I do. My, my only thing is I can't oh. wait for whatever you follow up with. Yes. <laughs> Yes. It's in the works. It's in I, the works. I want us to, if we can jump back for a moment to the um, the process question, because I really wanted to hear about, and, and because we're all creators of, of one sort or another here, and our audience is largely students, um, I would, I want them to know and to understand the, the creative process. It, it, it's not, it's not, you know, a two-day process. It's not an instant process. And so I wonder if Carlos and, and Paul, if you can um, talk a little bit more about from concept to uh, wow. writing more of the script to reaching out to an illustrator, if you can um, this, address that a little bit. It was, it was like I'd say, like a 20-year process that we could start from the very beginning. Is that okay, Chisa? <laughs> it's oh, wow. for it. Okay, okay. I was, minutes uh, or less. Okay, I was 19 years old. I was going to New Mexico Highlands University. I was a student and I, I was taking screenwriting classes, but I would come home in the summer and we lived in an agricultural area. There's a lot of uh, corn, livestock, a lot of ditches. And so I wanted to make extra money on the side. So I I'd go to these feedlots and buy calves and bring them home and I'd raise these calves. But but then this is going to bring up a sore subject to Paul, so I don't want to. <laughs> but anyway, I would I would hire my younger brothers and sisters uh, to 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 help me with the calves. That was a way to work and stuff. And one day, one of the calves got out and came back in, and Paul had a dream about it. Mm -hmm. And I wrote it down. I wrote the dream. Then I my older brother Julio he drew this scripture. He mm -hmm. we submitted it. We submitted it to these New York publishing houses, hoping that we they would pick it up. This Hispanic uh, book as a children's book but nobody would pick it up. Finally, a small publishing house out of uh, uh, California, Northern California, Berkeley, okay. California. In fact, she says, well, you know all about that place, right? <laughs> Is it our What's that? Um, what was the publishing house? It was oh, a Quinta Sol. Quinta Sol. Oh, Quinta Sol, okay. Yeah, Quinta yeah. Sol, yeah, Quinta Sol. Yeah. They, they published it in an anthology. It was right there next to Rudolph and I was next to a lot of stuff. And that got the whole ball rolling. And then I wrote a screenplay of, of it. And when I wrote the screenplay, I Paul was already moved to California, and we uh, and we polished it back and forth. And Paul could take over here. It's it, it, it's um so it's it's based on a dream that I had. Um, and this is the original version that that old our eldest brother Julio uh, illustrated for us. Wow. Um, oh, that's and cool. And then and then it went to the uh, a, a, a quick little version in, in this collection. Um, then years later, I'm in LA doing time, and I realized that Car Carlos has that screenplay, and I think, okay, this is, um, let's work on this, because uh, I, I was, I was acting-wise, I was playing the gangbanger, I was playing the, uh, the, uh, the guy that gets killed, and, and all these roles that are like, um, you know, there's more dignity in the, in the Chicano world than, than playing the gangbanger, <laughs> so I wanted to, I wanted to uh, uh, take, bring my own projects to the world. Um, but so it went from there to the grab a novel and Margaret came along, but I would like to say that it, it, it's always fluid for any writers out there. It's writing and rewriting and then rewriting again. Um, because from the dream that I had to literally a month before we put it to the, to the printers, Margaret came up with a very poignant little idea and we changed some of the dialogue. So it was, it was literally, it was a work in progress to the very end um, because she brought something to my attention that was like, yeah, this doesn't sound right. And, and we changed it really quick. And actually my uh, fiance Irma helped with some of the dialogue and then we gave it to Margaret and said, does this sound right? And she's all, that's it. That's what we needed. So it literally was uh, the, from the very beginning to the very end, it's always writing and rewriting. That's fantastic. <laughs> Collaboration. Exactly. Who's going to listen to you if they don't listen to me? <laughs> well said. Well, Paul, Carlos, and Margaret, thank you so much for joining us in uh, season two, episode one of Reggie We're thrilled that you were here. 
Uh, again, thanks to everyone out in the audience for attending, and thanks to all the people backstage who are making sure we all look like we know what we're doing. Um, we'll see everyone at the next ReggieCon panel Thursday, October 28th, when we celebrate LGBTQ History Month by discussing the award-winning graphic novel, My Favorite Thing is Monsters, and we will have uh, Emil Ferris here with us as well as awesome. Dr. Rachel Miller, who is teaching awesome. uh, teaching that. on that story um, this Ohio semester. Ohio State, once again. Thank you very much. There you go. <laughs> as well as CCAD. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So thanks, everyone. And uh, hopefully, we'll see you next month. Have a good evening. Thanks for coming. Thanks for Thank coming. You.